Hi, it's David Trace with the Autopian. This is Hubert Mees. Behind us is an early Tesla Model S featuring a suspension that he designed. So we're gonna go take a look at it, but first we're gonna take the wheels off. That'll do for now. All right, start with the front. Start with the front. Front suspension is actually, what it boils down to is a fairly standard double wishbone, but it has a, what's called a tall spindle. Underneath here, you have the lower wishbone, but this wishbone is actually split into two parts and each part connects to the knuckle individual. It's called a double ball joint. And the two ball joints actually create what is called a virtual ball joint. So instead of having a single ball joint that would be out here somewhere, what you have is two ball joints. And if you take the, if you draw a line through these links, projected them where they cross is where that ball joint would be if it were a standard type of A-arm. So we can sort of assume that this is the, the point of rotation is? The point of rotation is actually out here somewhere. Oh, oh okay. It's a virtual point of rotation. What's the benefit the, here? The, the benefit of this is that this allows you to pull the whole brake package inboard, put bigger brakes in the same size. And these are big. And these are big brakes. If you had that ball joint out here, all this would get pushed further outboard. It would have to shrink to be able to fit inside the wheel. Right. You see this in like BMWs, double ball joints often. You're BMW is the first one to use this in the mid 70s five series. Ah, oh, wow. They were the first to do that. And they had it on a McPherson strut. We have it here on a double wishbone. The upper wishbone way at the top is a traditional type of wishbone that you would expect to see. So this, oh my gosh, like from this, especially from this angle, this, Front knuckle is gigantic. It, it just it keeps going. It, it's, it's very tall, and that increases the spacing between the lower arm and the upper arm, which is good for handling all of the forces that a suspension has to withstand. Oh, okay. Having them further apart means they have less work to do to keep the knuckle under control. Because they have a, a moment arm. They have a bigger moment arm. If you're trying to twist something, it's easier to twist it by doing that than by doing this, isn't right. it? Yeah, it is. And same with resisting that twist. If you're trying to hold something and stop it from twisting, then it's easier to do that if your hands are far apart than if they're really close together. Right. Same here. Get these wishbones far apart, then the, the, the cornering forces on the wheel become easier for the suspension to handle. And then the other element of it is the spring and the damper that is attached to this lower link here. The now, air, in this where case, is the spring? Is it an air spring? It, this is an air spring. So this car has air springs, so you don't see a traditional coil, but the air spring is inside this housing. Inside this shell is a rubber diaphragm and pressurized air. Oh. It's like a balloon. Mm -hmm. And it's a balloon that's con constrained inside this aluminum tube. And so it can only bulge in one direction, which is downward and push down on this, the, this shock absorber housing and thereby push down on the suspension. Okay, so up on the car. Right, so you need that damper at the bottom of it because a balloon's not damped, right? You so hit a balloon and it'll, that's right. Right, it'll bounce forever. Like a bouncy castle. So right. you still need a shock absorber like you have in any other vehicle. And that's what this is. The, and this shock absorber, there's nothing particularly special about it. It is a relatively standard type of shock absorber. Yeah, okay. You told me something about the steering rack on this car. Yeah, so the steering rack on this car is interesting because steering racks are very expensive to tool. If you want to design your own steering rack and then have someone build the tools for you, you're going to spend well over a million dollars doing that. In the early days, Tesla didn't have that kind of money. So the other way to do that is to find a steering gear that is being made by someone else and see, can we use that? And so that's what we did. In this case, we went to ZF Lengstystein and we said, okay, what are you producing now? That's close. Yep. And as it turns out, they were just about to go into production with a steering rack for the Land Rover Evoque. And it looked almost perfect for what we wanted. The only problem is that the Land Rover Evoque has its steering rack here, meaning behind the center line of the wheel. Oh, so a push becomes a pull now. Exactly. So left becomes a right. Exactly. So if, so if you were to just install that, you would be turning it the wrong you direction. You would be going, that's right. You, you'd have a, a, a nice circus ride. Because if you put, <laughs> you take a rack that's meant to go here and you put it here in front of the center line of the axle. Now, when you turn the wheel to the left, the car will go to the right. That, <laughs> I've driven a car that was built that way and it's impossible. <laughs> the solution we came up with was to take 
the steering gear for the right-hand drive Evoque, flip it upside down, and move it to the front and use it in our car. Okay. That reverses the direction of the, of the steering, and then putting it in front of the axle unreverses it effectively. And so the, the mounting of the rack is a bit odd. Huh, okay. But it's something that we had to. You can see it. that here, how this, this piece here the bracket. goes all the way up to the top because the, the, the bolts for the steering rack ended up being on top, which is a very unusual place. You wouldn't want the bolts to be that way and they're horizontal. So that's how we got the steering gear. Okay, what about and the C-Factor? Was that close enough? The C-Factor, no, the C-Factor was not. The C-Factor in this gear was 65. What did you need? We figured something in the 50 to 55 range. So it's too high. If I remember, right? So it's too high, yeah. which means that for every turn in the steering wheel, the rack moved too much. Yep. And you got too much steering. And the, the result of that is that when you're driving down the road, the car became very quick. So you move the steering a bit and uh, you know, the, the On car the highway, steer. could you drive the it? highway, it, it was very difficult to drive. You really had to pay attention. What we ended up doing was changing something called the roll understeer. The roll understeer is something that every suspension has. And what it, it, what it means is that as the wheel moves up and down, it's also steering a little bit. As it goes up, it steers out. The reason you do that is that when, when you go into a turn, the body rolls, effectively, the outside wheel is moving up and the inside wheel is moving down. Mm -hmm. What roll understeer then does is as that wheel moves up, it steers the wheel out of the turn. It, it tries to steer the car back straight again. So you've got this mechanism to steer it without actually steering without it. Without actually steering it. So I see where you're going with this. I think. So what we did was we added more roll understeer to the car. When you steer the car, you give it a certain amount of steering, the car rolls, the suspension kind of remove some of that steering, it unsteers the Wait vehicle. Wait a second, so you had a steering rack that was steering too much for the given input, and so right. you basically canceled out the input by- That's right. By basically having the suspension, the suspension go the other direction. Negated some of that steering. Functionally, the, way, the, the, the easy way to do that is to take this tie rod end, and in this case, move it down. And by moving it down, it meant that as this link moves through its arc up and down, it wanted oh, to push that the way. wheel outward. Yes, it's cheap, but also it's good engineering because at the end of the day, that can theoretically bring the price down while still getting the functionality you need. That's right. Should we look at the back? Let's look at the back because there's another story at the back, which is very interesting. Huh. The back is what is known as an integral link. And this is a concept that was, again, designed by BMW first back in the mid 90s. They introduced it on the 5 Series. And the basic design is a lower arm, and it looks like it's kind of an H-shaped yep. arm. And then there are two links on the top. There's one link way up at the top here. Yep. And there's another link that's, you can kind of see it at the, towards oh, the yeah, top. Oh yeah, yeah, right up here. And there's this link. This link is the key to making this system work. This lower arm here is attached to the, to the frame at two points on the inboard side. Mm -hmm. It is attached to the knuckle on the outboard side, and then also attached to the knuckle are those two links at the top. Yep. Mm -hmm. This arm and those two links control what's called the camber of the, of the suspension. Yep. It stops the wheel from tipping over, mm -hmm. but the, the wheel can still rock fore and aft. There's nothing stopping that yet. Oh, so, so the top two arms don't act as a The top bone. two arms because they, they they're parallel. Could, they could just run in parallel. Okay. As this thing is rocking back and forth, those just do move in parallel. Where, they, they don't control if they, it. If they were shaped like this, it would be more like it, a double wishbone. That's right. Okay. This little integral link stops that rocking because it connects between the, the same lower arm and the knuckle. Oh, so this would go under compression? This would go under compression when you're in braking. Yeah. And it would go under tension as you're trying to accelerate. Tesla just didn't have the money to tool up and make these very fancy uh, control arms that you see in some other cars. It's expensive. So what we did in order to save money, what we did was we designed this control arm here to be the same part on the left and the right side. This is the left part, take it, flip it over, and you have the right part. Wow. It's exactly the same part. So what that meant was we only had to make one tool and we get two parts out of it. Has anybody ever done that on this suspension design? A Not design? that I'm aware of, no. Wow, that's cheap but brilliant. The other thing we did was all of the other links, those are extrusions. Okay, what and does that mean? 
Now, an extrusion, if you picture this link, imagine that this is a slice of bread. Okay. And it's part of a bread loaf. And there's another piece, another piece of bread here, another one there, oh, yeah. another mm -hmm. one there, another one there, another one. That's what an extrusion is. It's part of a much longer part that is then sliced. Oh. To create these. And it comes out of a, a die. It is a, a huge slug of, of aluminum. It's rammed through a die that has this shape. Oh. Huh. And so you get this kind of loaf of aluminum that comes out of it mm -hmm. in this shape. And then you just cut them and you make the part. You got dozens of little links. That's right. If we were to forge this, which would be the other approach to do, you'd be paying for about $100,000, $200,000 in tools to make the tool to make this part. Same with the upper link. Same with the other upper link. That's that so adding you're talking, up quick. You're, you're, add, you're, you're quickly talking half a million to a million dollars in tools. And then you've got one part on the left, one part on the right. So you very quickly start spending a lot of money on tools. This extrusion die, I'm pretty sure, cost about four thousand dollars. What? That's it? That's it. This, the the other links, they're a little longer, they're a little more complex, so the extrusion dies were a little more expensive, but none of them were more than ten thousand dollars. Wow. So for ten thousand dollars, you bought yourself a tool instead of a couple hundred thousand. That's dollars. huge. It's a huge thing. So we bought one set of tools. We got two sets of parts out of each one, and we got a suspension that works really well saved the company a lot of money and made made life a lot easier. There are a lot of Tesla fans out there. And That's this right. is the car that really fundamentally started it all. Started. There, there was the Roadster, but the this- The Roadster, yeah. This this is the car that really put the company on the map. Anyway, if you're, if you're impressed with the Tesla Model S and how it, how it handled, you can thank this guy right here. <laughs>